Hi, and good day to all who are tuning in to our webinar from Singapore, Asia, Europe, and elsewhere. My name is Tuan, I'm from SG Innovate. We are a Singapore government-owned organization that invests in and helps build deep tech startups, talent, and ecosystem. It is our privilege today to jointly host this webinar on AI and ethics with the Netherlands Innovation Network, the Netherlands AI Coalition, and also in partnership with the NTU Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity. On behalf of our partners, I would like to for us all to extend a warm welcome to our speakers today. We have Professor Peter Paul from the University of Trent in the Netherlands, Dr. Chong Gyuk Sin, the Chairman of Singapore Computer Society, Dr. David Hardun from the Union Bank of the Philippines, Marcus from Microsoft Asia, and Professor Vanessa Evers from the NTU Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity. I personally am very much looking forward to today's discussion. Over the years, as SGNOVIC works with startups, governments, corporations, and universities, we have noticed heightened interest, not only in what AI can do, but also in how we may trust AI systems to make decisions for us. This state of trust in AI is an important determinant of how fast our economy and society may adopt AI solutions. Therefore, last year, SG Innovate, along with our global partners, have actually launched our Deep Tech for Good initiative to advance science and technology innovation for economic and social good, including the ethical and responsible use of AI. In Singapore, there has been many good examples of public-private partnerships to develop guidelines on AI ethics, such as the recent Artificial Intelligence Ethics and government Governance Body of Knowledge by the Singapore Computer Society and IMBA, which I'm sure Yoxin will be able to elaborate more on uh, soon enough. And in financial services sector, the MAS has also been working with industry players, uh, including Microsoft on the fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency principles, which SG Innovate and also David were involved in at various stages. So one gap that we see is emerging is that globally, there are over 170 such guidelines on AI ethics. But how it is that we are going to implement and put these guidelines to practice? And that is a big question that I am very much looking forward to how the uh, esteemed panel that we have today will be able to, to address this uh, with us. And now I would like to pass the time to our friend and partner, Astrid, who is the Head of Innovation at the Netherlands Embassy in Singapore, for her to say a few words before we get started. Astrid, please. Thank you, Tuan. Uh, thank you uh, all for joining us today. Very happy that we are finally able to do this event, although it is again digitally. It all, all, always warms my heart to see that there are so many people from different parts of the world joining us. Um, SD Innovate, thanks again for, uh, for part partnering up. Uh, uh, SD Innovate is an important partner for us. Uh, as the Netherlands Innovation Network uh, at the Netherlands Embassy in Singapore, uh, we support and assist in setting up R&D collaborations between Singapore and the Netherlands. And webinars like the ones we have here today are very important, uh, are, are a very important part of our work. Uh, as Tuan was just saying, there are a lot of guidelines being developed all over the world. Uh, uh, and I think this is an important step to really exchange thoughts also. Uh, how do we get to these guidelines? Uh, are there any best practices? So this is, uh, I'm very excited, uh, excited for today. I want to thank uh, Professor uh, Vanessa Evers, of course, for being the moderator, our panelists for being here today. Um, please connect with us, the Netherlands Innovation Network in Singapore uh, via LinkedIn. We are always happy to hear ideas and thoughts if you are based in Singapore, if you are based in the Netherlands and are interested to team up. Um, we will share the details for our LinkedIn and I will also share a link to a current call that is open the Clusters AI call. Uh, with this call, companies uh, are able to get support uh, for R&D projects between Singapore and Dutch SMEs. 
Um, yeah, I have nothing much to add. Just would like to give the floor to Vanessa, uh, our moderator for today, and uh, look forward to this uh, crash course AI and ethics. Vanessa, over to you. Thank you, Astrid. Thank you, Tuan. So this is the panel on AI and ethics, the key to successful human AI relationships, which I think is an extremely intriguing title. I love the focus on the relationships uh, between people and AI. So my name is Vanessa Evers. I'll be the moderator today. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity at NTU. And uh, my research is on social aspects and consequences of AI and robotics. Uh, SG Innovate, uh, the UN, and uh, NIST, the Institute, are partners in the Deep Tech for Good initiative, of which you saw the beautiful video, where we focus on how AI can benefit the lives of people. And this panel is part of a series of all sorts of activities that we are trying to bring into life. I'd really like to thank SG Innovate, of course, and the Embassy of the Netherlands, especially Ambassador Magritte Fono, for bringing forward this important topic. I think it's important to mention that Magritte is a really strong champion of artificial intelligence research and especially the relationships between the Netherlands and Singapore. Uh, she has created many opportunities for collaboration and is, has been always very active on this front. So thank you a lot for that. Um, Singapore, of course, has since 2019, the model AI governance framework, model framework for broader consultation adoption and feedback. So this framework provides detailed and implementable guidance for the private sector uh, organizations to address these key ethical and governance issues. And uh, the Netherlands it has a very strong tradition in philosophy of technology, ethics of technology. And this natural link between our two countries seems very clear for us to join forces on tackling some of the many questions concerning ethics and AI. So, let me first introduce the panel to you. Please use the, the chat to introduce yourself. Let us know that you exist in this virtual space. Uh, we're very happy to hear from you. We'll try to be as interactive as possible in this remote medium. Mm, the Q&A we'll use for all your questions, but please don't just post questions. Give us some feedback. If you, know, you feel your question hasn't been addressed enough, if you have an, uh, a feedback on anything that we say, please put that in the Q&A. We're very happy to engage with you there. So let me start by introducing our very illustrious panel. It's a real honor to bring these people together and to have them here uh, today. So thank you so much for joining us. First, uh, Professor Dr. Peter Paul Verbeek, who is from the University of Twente. He's a distinguished professor of philosophy of technology at the University of Twente and co-director of the Design Lab in the Netherlands, uh, of which I'm also the co-director. So that's where the link is. He's the chairman of UNESCO's Commission of Ethics of Scientific Knowledge and Technology and an expert at the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence. Something you may not know about Peter Paul is that he is a very accomplished pianist really concert level skills. So if you ever have the opportunity to be at a conference with him, make sure you get him behind the piano. It's really something. And also, he's a father of four children and they're all boys. Just something interesting about it. Dr. David Hardoon, Senior Advisor for Data and Artificial Intelligence, the Union Bank Philippines. David, you are the former Chief Data Officer of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And something you may not know about David is that he wrote a book with the title, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Data Science. And I love the Hitchhiker's Guide books. So I was a fan immediately. Um, if I remember correctly, David, you're also a fan of the Witcher fantasy novels, which gives us a very tenuous link with the Netherlands because the Witcher is written by a Polish writer. But when people ask you where you're from and you say Holland, people immediately say, oh, Poland. So, you know, there's the extremely tenuous link to that. Dr. Chong Yok Singh, you are a managing partner at iGlobe Partners and chairperson, AI Ethics and Government Steering Committee of Singapore. You were previously a CEO of Integrated Health Information System and NCS. Uh, you are president of the Executive Council of the Singapore Computer Society. And I tried to look up all your board positions, but there are really too many to mention. <laughs> uh, it's really wonderful to have you in this panel. Um, what people may not know is that 
I knew about you before this because you made a wonderful statement and I just wanted to say it here. And it's this one. Women have contributed to the development and progress of the digital economy across the entire spectrum of roles from support to leadership in equal measure as men. And I think that's just a wonderful comment uh, that I really wanted to repeat here. Thank you. Marcus Bartley Johns is the Asia Regional Director, Government Affairs and Public Policy of Microsoft. He used to work at the World Trade Bank as a trade specialist, and you worked a lot on public policy in the digital world. Um, something may, you may not know about Marcus is that it's impossible to find anything to know about Marcus online. Uh, even his Facebook page only has one photo. So I think if we use the crowdsource that we have now to find out more about him, we may find out something, but he's the mystery man of this panel. Okay, so let us start. Uh, what I wanted to do is just start us off with a few warm up questions. Uh, so that the audience can get to know each of you a little bit better. And then we are very open to engage with you. So please don't hold back, uh, start putting in your questions or uh, some topics you would like us to talk about in the Q&A as soon as you want, and we'll switch over to engage with you as quickly as possible. So I wanted to start with this general question for each of you, a very short statement, kind of saying, on which side are you? And there's the side of uh, people say Elon Musk, who believes that AI poses a real fundamental risk, perhaps the greatest risk to the existence of people, of, of human civilization. Or do you follow more the line of people like Mark Zuckerberg, who are, say, positive about AI? Dr. Chong Yok Sing, would you want to start with your statement on this? Yeah. I mean, I like to be unbiased. <laughs> So I think both of them have, have their equal measure, you know, of um, truth. So I like to say that, you know, I would like to, you know, have the full measure of AI, but control the abuse of it by people. That's yeah. great. So I think, uh, Peter Paul, David and Marcus, we can take our mute off and hopefully uh, the, the banter between us will, will be good and we won't have too much interference from the outside noise. Paul, do you want to give your statement? Yeah, actually, I think both of them are wrong <laughs> because they somehow take the human out of the equation. So it's either AI is doing good or AI is doing bad. And I think it's actually all about the interactions and the relations between humans and AI from both directions. So AI should treat humans responsibly and humans should use AI responsibly somehow. So we need to find a third way, I think. Yeah, I, I would jump in on that one, and I fully agree that it's not it's not black and white. I think I think if anything, <laughs> thus the world of data science has taught us, in fact, becomes a bit more tricky when we come to the ethical considerations of things. It's not black and white. It's not a one way or the other. It is really kind of a com combined aspiration. There could be situations where it could be the disastrous, and that exact same thing that can be disastrous could be a, the, a cure. Effectively, it is it is the context in which it is um, reviewed or leveraged upon. Well, I'm, I'm going to do the boring thing and agree with everyone else. <laughs> and, uh, but but I, I particularly like your point, Peter Paul, that it's, you know, the human element that's so essential here. AI is an incredibly powerful technology, like many other technologies that have come through our history as a species, but it's our interaction with and utilisation of those technologies that is what makes a difference. So I, I think it's that human element that's so important to not lose sight of. I think it's nice to see that we are all already moving around to the Singapore cultural thing to, to definitely not disagree with each other too much. But uh, let, let's see if we can get the Dutch. Uh, the well, Dutch well, well, maybe uh, maybe to be controversial, <laughs> I, I would say that, I mean, if you look at the worlds of, um, <clears throat> since you mentioned Elon Musk and, and Zuckerberg, um, just look at the organization perhaps in a slightly more hot water than the other. So I would say that maybe in that kind of situation, you want to err on the uh, the, the cautionary view that it's going to be a bit more detrimental to humanity. So if that perspective will result in a better outcome, maybe I'd lean to that. <laughs> this sounds really good. I see a few questions coming in already, so I'll give it a little bit more time for a few more questions to come in. Maybe we can combine a, a few things, and I'll start off with a, with a few warm-up questions, if that's okay with you guys. Um, Peter Paul, um, could you share a little bit on your work uh, in, at the University of Twente with the Design Lab and maybe the Dutch AI Coalition, which might be interesting for us to hear about here in Singapore. 
Yeah, super happy to do that. Well, the Design Lab uh, is a place where we try to connect science and society through design. So uh, design should be taken very broadly as a way to connect and to use your creativity to make these, these links. So we focus actually on three things uh, in our Design Lab. One is on design, of course, on responsible design, as we call it. So how to design for societal challenges. And the second is citizen science. And so how to engage society in doing science, actually. And the third is to develop ways of working beyond disciplines and also with societal partners, transdisciplinary research. So that's the, the three things that we focus on. And that actually matches quite nicely what the Dutch AI coalition is doing. And so the AI coalition is also an organization where all partners come together and what people call the quadruple helix. So it's academia, of course, but also governmental organizations, uh, companies, and also citizens, civil society. And together we uh, well try to build better AI. And uh, I'm involved in a, a subline there, which is called a human-centered AI, AI for society, you could call it. And we're developing ELSA labs there for ethical, legal, and social aspects to address specific societal issues regarding AI. Great, thanks a lot. Um, uh, Dr. Chong Yok Sing, could I ask yeah. you about the artificial intelligence ethics and government body of knowledge? As the Singapore Computer Society, you are the president, and IMDA, they've recently announced this. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about the key outcomes that, that you are personally hoping for. Yeah, so we actually formed this, um, uh, you know, we form a governance committee in the first place, right, uh, between IMDA and SES primarily to actually, pro, um, you know, uh, propose, right, the ethical use of AI focused on human centricity. So as you know, you know, um, ethical use of AI could have many aspects, right, but I think the key aspect that we were very much, um, you know, wanted to propound and, and therefore, you know, build trust upon is actually this human centricity. And, and, and what we did was that um, IMDA itself, right, uh, went ahead to do the model governance framework uh, for companies to adopt an AI framework, um, you know, for, for governance, for, for management uh, use. And uh, what we did was that we, we tried to ensure, right, the certification of professionals. Um, so they, they will undergo, uh, you know, professionals interested to have a certificate uh, in ethics in AI, right, can actually take a course, uh, which is uh, currently run by the NTU for, for this certification purpose. And all the causes, whether it's NTU or from many other uh, Institute of Higher Learning, will actually predicate their training right upon our body of knowledge. So this body of knowledge or the SES Ethics in AI body of knowledge was written by 60 people, 60 professionals and, uh, and leaders in the industry who came together to, to actually you know, contribute to their, their writings and their thinking, as well as use cases very practical use cases, which um, actually help to guide, you know, the implementation of AI. So, so we did all that together with IMDA in order that we could actually have a self-regulatory environment rather than, a, you know, externally or, or, or government imposed regulation um, at this point in time of AI development, because we feel that actually AI must be given its space, you know, um, to, to actually uh, fulfill its promise because it would be actually permeating in almost every aspect, you know, of the way we live, work and play, and in almost every aspect of the solutions for these. So, so we're quite happy, we're very happy, actually, very um, grateful that, you know, the industry came together, you know, to, to contribute to this piece. Um, along with that, too, we have um, adoption. So we're also promoting adoption of um, the model governance, as well as, um, the you know, uh, sending people for training and certification, right, we're we, have a promote, we promoted that through an adoption um, kind of um, forum. So all in, 75 uh, companies have actually signed up, you know, to, to actually pledge, you know, their commitment to ethical AI. I think it's really interesting, especially this type of er experimental uh, approach to it, I think is really admirable. David, um, yeah. something very interesting. You moved from the Monetary Authority to the Union Bank Philippines. And, you know, I know your passion for the cause of uh, ethics around AI. I would love to hear a bit about, you know, what do you feel you, you can do in a real bank environment that you, you can't do from the outside? Yeah, well, one can start off by saying that I'm a sucker for pain, you know, going from the regulator to the regulated. Um, but uh, maybe I am. It's one of my strongest beliefs when it comes to this whole dimension. And again, 
whichever you want to call it, AI, machine learning, data science, it, it buckets in the same area, is we need to walk the talk. Um, and not that a regulator doesn't walk the talk, it also obviously operates from an industrial umbrella point of view. And one of the things that I've been absolutely passionate about is really getting into the thick, thick of things and seeing how can we go about, not just in a sandbox environment, not just as a POC, not just as a pilot, and we all know POC in Singapore stands for die, die, must work, uh, to actually build these underlying solutions that are able to deliver what we all envisage and promise from AI. For example, uh, ident uh, so, you know, uh, tailorized VIP RM capabilities on a mass scale, being able to predict uh, uh, proxies for risk when there is no traditional financial information, or, you know, or people may not even have a bank account or credit score, but we're still able to identify these things. But assuring that at the absolute forefront of it, it is embedded with governance. It's embedded with those underlying principles that we now know of a lot more acutely in be it on a developmental stage of the world of AI or be it in the operationalization for it. And obviously now working in the financial institutions in the Philippines, and as some may or may not be aware, about 65 million uh, Filipinos outside the formal financial system, either underbanked or unbanked altogether, it's really a situation of if, if, it, if, if there's a possibility of really making an impact and making a difference in terms of leveraging these type of uh, alternative mechanisms powered by AI, it is there. And if I may, I just wanted to add one particular point in the sake of a uh, uh, Dutch debate, maybe, as you were mentioning earlier. Actually, I'm one of the biggest advocates for government regulation when it comes to AI. I, I, I believe we kind of reach the cusp of what uh, organizations can regulate for themselves. It's not because um, there is any um, malicious or ill intent. Absolutely not. It's just because we're reaching that stage whereby there's a potentially societal impact. And let me give you a very, very, and actually, actually it's relevant to what I'm, the, the application that's in finance, give you a very, very simple example of that. We may say from a systemic or regulatory perspective that I'm only going to look at DCIVs or GCIVs. So basically systemically important organizations, institutions, and whether it's going to cause a particular impact. For example, if a, a relationship manager or someone that provides you a loan agent uh, cheats you or in indeliberately discriminated and it's a large sum. Now, when you go to the world of artificial intelligence, when you have agents and you're looking at now providing the ability for anyone to invest, for example, even in a quantity of 50 bucks or 100 bucks or even 10 bucks, and you may say, oh, well, that's not material, it, it, it's, it's a small amount. But now with an artificial intelligence mechanism behind it, it's theoretically applicable to an infinite number of people. The impact at that scale is astronomical. It, it, it's, it's, what was that, Reagan and, uh, uh, um, oh, the Russian side, I always forget his name, uh, uh, Gorbachev. Yep, it's, Gorbachev. It's, thank you. It was, you know, trust, but oversight. I, I think we kind of reached that stage. It, it's important to have that oversight capacity for the implications of data. Thanks, David. That's a great point. Unfortunately, Marcus, now we don't have time for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> For you. Uh, Marcus, Microsoft is kind of, is in a way US bound, of course, but it's, it's of course a global company. And I would love to hear your reflection on uh, this idea of regulation of AI, harnessing of AI. Is this a universal thing? Are there universal solutions? Or should we allow for cultural diversity uh, for that? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, here, so you'll have it soon there. <laughs> it's it, it's uh, it's an important question. It's obviously not a small question, but I think particularly in a in a discussion where not only in the panel, but I can see in the audience, we've got people all over the world. It, it is an important one. Look, I think just taking a step back, one thing that's been striking over the last few years, and it was a point that Tuan made right at the start, is this proliferation of sets of AI principles. That have been issued by by governments, by companies like ourselves, by individual sectoral regulators like the Monetary Authority of Singapore. When when David was there under his under his leadership, you know th there is this proliferation of AI principles that's happened, and I, I think a lot of it has happened in Europe. A lot of it's happened in North America, but it's happened in our region as well. You know, there's been a huge amount of this that's that's been happening in Asia too. And I think what's striking is when you when you look across all of these, and there has been some interesting analysis done of this, there is a huge amount of commonality at the level of principles. And even in surprising 
ways that you might not expect when you're looking at some principles that have come from organisations in China, for example. There are real common points with what have come from the EU in recent years. So when we look at that level of principles, I think there's there's a, a striking commonality that people care about issues like fairness. They care about issues like transparency. Now, to, to, to get to your, your point about cultural and social and legal variation, it's when we take those principles and implement them that the local context is hugely important. And we, we, can, we can talk about these technologies in the abstract as much as we like, but it's the implementation issues that that's really where the challenges are going to start to emerge. And I think that that's where we start to see the variation come. The legal context is going to be different. The way a certain set of privacy laws are written in one country is going to entail a different set of expe expectations about how people's personal data is handled compared to others. So it is absolutely something where there's going to be cultural, societal, legal variation from one place to the next. And we, we need to be mindful of that. I, the, the last thing I'd say, though, is I, I think from, from Microsoft's perspective, we do also need to um, be, you know, be grounded in a set of universal values, particularly universal human rights values that are applicable globally. You know, th this is not completely relative from one place to the next. There has to be some set of foundational principles that are, that are going to be relevant across the world. Thanks, Marcus. So the proof is in the pudding. That's a really uh, good, good point. So I'd like to switch over to some of the questions that have come uh, from the audience. And um, there's a question that I think um, many of us will, will face a lot in, in, in panels when it's about ethics. And it's, uh, it's really about uh, uh, what are the most critical aspects at the moment. So Linda is asking us, uh, what do you consider to be the most critical aspect of AI and ethics going on right now that you, we should be thinking about? So maybe we could also translate this into thinking about what kind of sectors are really important at the moment. Um, yeah, but we'll, uh, let's see, Marcus, maybe it makes sense that you speak to that first. Sure. I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't pick one or two. You know, I, I think that, and that's in terms of specific principles or specific technologies or, or specific applications. I think, again, it, it does come back to context. Um, and from, from some of the conversations we're involved in with governments, with our customers, which is, is interesting, um, it, this is where the, the big questions are starting to come up. Uh, as, we, as we see people distinguishing more and more between different uses of AI, um, for example, people realizing, okay, there's AI underpinning the way they use some of their basic enterprise productivity software, an email, you know, calendar software like Microsoft Outlook, there's AI that's helping suggest meeting times in that, for example. So as people get greater awareness of that, they'll then think, well, okay, there might be some more sensitive uses and, and maybe those are the more critical aspects that I need to pay attention to more. The use of facial recognition, for example, you know, facial recognition technologies are being used in a way that could have a potentially harmful impact, maybe those are the critical aspects that we need to be focusing our attention on more. So I think that that's where I see those the, the criticality being focused more. It's, it's on those sensitive, potentially harmful scenarios for AI. Thanks. I guess it's, it's such a huge meta level topic that, you know, all of us, we like to get a little bit more grip on, you know, just tell us where the priorities are so that we can focus a little bit. Uh, Dr. Chung, would you like to? to yeah, respond? thanks. Thanks for the question. I think focusing on priority. I mean, personally, I think, you know, AI is very pervasive. It's, it's going to be like, you know, tech, tech equal to AI. And, and that's going to be, I mean, the way, you know, um, tech can actually be enhanced. So, I mean, just like in tech, we always had, you know, our penetration tests, you know, we would have a quality assurance and all that, right? So the same way, I think for AI, right, we can't look at AI as a black box. You know, rather, you know, AI should also be subject to the sorts of tests that we put our normal IT through, right? Of course, you know, AI learns and AI, you know, generates AI. Um, but I think uh, we have to be mindful, you know, in the usage of it that, you know, regular, on a regular basis, right, it needs to be well governed, well governed by being well tested, you know, for bias, for any biasness for his algorithm, for, for the data that is presenting to it, you know, for that, that, that results in the outcomes and the decisions that it makes. So I think while, you know, many talk about uh, having, um, you know, 
kind of augment AI as an augmentation tool, right? Or even at the at the lowest level as an assistive tool, you know, rather than as an autonomous tool, right? That makes uh, the decisions that Elon Musk is talking, you know, uh, or warning us about. I, I think, um, you know, that is actually a journey. So as we get to know, uh, as we get to use AI uh, more and more, right? I, I think these uh, tests and these uh, quality controls and all that have to be actually built into the system. I think I do agree that while AI is, uh, you know, we, we need to look at the biasness from the user standpoint, you know, um, from, from the damage that it can do, right? If we didn't control it better, but I think we need to use clever tech, you know, to, to kind of um, uh, harness AI, right? Or I won't say control it, but kind of harness it so that, you know, we are using it for, for you know, what is, uh, what, what, what is beneficial to us. I mean, just like when, you know, we invented a knife, right? A knife can kill, a knife can, a knife can heal, right? So, so basically, it, it, it boils down to the same thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, organizing it and uh, governing it so that, you know, the use by humans is actually ethical and moral. Of course, AI can't, can't be moral, but at least, you know, we can drive it to the kinds of outcomes that uh, we expect. And that's by having ethical AI. Thanks. I see Peter Paul and David uh, are jumping to respond to you, but <laughs> we're going on to the next question because, you know, we have a lot of people to service today. So uh, I wanted to move on to a question by Devesh. And uh, he's saying that, uh, you know, these terms like explainability, fairness, trustworthiness, they might be too vague to usefully kind of guide AI development. Um, so maybe Peter Paul, you'd like to start and then David, you can jump in uh, whenever you're ready. <laughs> super, yeah, super important question. I think many people are feeling this, right? So we have many, many, many lists of principles, standards, frameworks, uh, and it almost feels a bit cheap if you have them, right? So you have them and then so what? So I think everyone is now discovering that we need to make them come true. To, uh, and, and that's also where the theme of cultural diversity comes into play, I think. And so the next step uh, is uh, stage two that we are in now is to connect them to real life. And um, well, for instance, here in the Netherlands, we've developed an approach, guidance ethics, it's called, where we try to uh, enable people to translate these values to real life. And so by anticipating the impact of a concrete AI system, not in general AI, but a concrete system, a system that helps citizens uh, to find a way out when they have debt, so when they need mental health care or something, and then um, try to see what effects it could have on the users, on the healthcare uh, givers, on uh, family members, and then see what values are at stake there in order to see, can we use the values for a, for a redesign of the technology, for legislation, regulation, for empowering users. And so the translation from the principles to real life, to actual systems in the here and now, <laughs> that's what we really, really need. Okay, I'm gonna take that opening as a point to jump in. Uh, look, I, I completely, completely relate, but perhaps to give two analogies. One is we better start with what we have because if we wait for perfection, we'll never have anything. And the second one, to maybe give a slightly interesting or contradictory, not contradictory, but a different perspective, man, that's the word I was looking for, is we constantly are circling around AI. In fact, a lot of these concepts are concepts that are critically important independently of AI. And after we spent, this is back in 2018, when we spent nearly eight months of debating on 14 principles, these were the feed principles, fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency, exactly the point saying that they're vague. And the biggest is, it was really the realization that we have to boil them down into the most simplistic forms and what does it mean? So for example, when it comes to um, 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 uh, fairness, what, what, what does it mean when it's fair? Is Because it, I, I have five kids. Uh, so, <laughs> and everything that they don't get, it's, it's unfair. So what is fairness? And we boiled it down to the comment, well, something is unfair is whereby you're systematically uh, disadvantaging an individual group of individual. And then as a proof of the matter, you can demonstrate that it's being disadvantaged. Now, is that perfect? No, but it's something that we can now work on. And this is the second dimension becomes really important. When I turn around and have conversation with organizations saying, put AI aside, how do you currently in your services, in your products, verify or assure that you're not disadvantaging an individual? That was the answer. So to me, it's a realization of going, ah, okay, we, we kind of need something in place, however imperfect, however 
hodgepodge together that it says, okay, we're, we think this is good enough. And then it's the application of AI because AI effectively, it's an amplification. It's an acceleration of that essentially. Thanks, David and Faithful. I think you guys are also kind of in, uh, addressing Edito's and uh, Ian Carter's questions around, um, you know, how to take diversity into account, how to make sure it's not just for the privileged few that are that are really benefiting uh, from this. And there, there will, of course, be a, a bunch more questions around that. And we will can, I, can I just, just add a particular point? Because I think and, and again, my, my, my origin is really, I'm, I'm, I always like to say, I need a shirt that says the geek, um, the data science from an academic point of view. And I, there was a huge debate online about this as well. But we need to also remember that at the end of the day, AI currently, not reach, achieve, uh, achieving singularity yet, is a mathematical, statistical-based methodology. It has no ethic and no can it have. And that's why I always get a bit kind of uh, uh, edgy when I hear the word AI ethics and uh, or ethical AI, sorry, ethical AI. I'm like, no, that 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 that's that's an oxymoron. You have an AI. It is us which apply the rules on top of it, which allows the ethical aspect of it. Now, the reason I emphasize that point is because at the end of the day, it will look for a pattern. That pattern may be represent something that has historical biasness. That may be something that we do not accept as a society. Like, well, then a better drive. I'm kidding. But it is us for to apply that principle. And just to give another example, I was having a debate, someone, for example, in Europe, where I was saying the vast majority of mortgages are given to middle-aged white men. So therefore, the model will have a certain bias to middle-aged white men. Well, the fact that we know that doesn't mean we need to stop using AI, saying, well, I'm going to build my model and make sure that from a data-centric point of view, it's going to be applied and used for middle-aged middle white men who are applying for a loan. For those who do not apply uh, under that underlying characteristic and demographics, we're not going to use that model. Nothing is wrong for using a, the rule-based system. Nothing, you, not, nothing stops us from building another model effectively. So we need to take a very pragmatic and parsimonious approach in solving this very, very big problem which touches on society effectively. I see we are moving into the philosophical realm yeah. in this panel. Uh, I, I'll have to hold back our philosopher here, Peter Paul, to uh, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> but I, I was I just, trying. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I will get you question. later. <laughs> I just want to throw a question on top, Peter Paul, and uh, and then also give the chance to Marcus and Yuxi. Uh, that's from from Joseph Gan. In uh, the the question is, can AI be conscious and eventually equal to human? And so this is kind of. Uh, building forward on that singularity thing that David mentioned. So, Peter Paul, maybe you want to take it first and then... Yeah, 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 of course. So, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert in the sense that I could answer it empirically, but I don't think actually that it is a, a very important question. <laughs> maybe that's the most important thing to say, because I think um, this type of questions has always accompanied technologies when they are coming into play. Will they not ultimately replace the human? And when the steam engine was invented, people tried to destroy it because it, it was it could take people's jobs, etc. And if you think like this, you only think in terms of AI versus the human. And will AI do what humans only could do until AI was there? And you forget to think about the relations. So I think uh, even if AI would be conscious somehow, I, I would not know what it means. I also don't know how I, our rabbit is conscious. <laughs> I do respect it. And so maybe we might reach a stage that we might need to treat technologies with a bit more uh, forms of respect <laughs> than we do now. Uh, and I wouldn't mind, actually. I think it can be very helpful. And there's a whole discussion, for instance, about voice assistants uh, that actually uh, people maltreat uh, and that could also somewhat trickle down to interpersonal communication. Uh, so a bit of ethics in our dealing with technologies could be good. But being afraid that they will take over and that they will need human rights, etc. I think that's, uh, well, taking the question wrongly. I think that maybe just to, to build on that, I think we also need to ask ourselves, what do we want? I mean, we, we have agency here. Um, I think sometimes when we talk about these are, these are important questions, they're big questions, but we sometimes think about it in this passive way. Um, now, maybe that does reflect that people sometimes feel like change, the pace of change is getting away from them a little bit, but I think it is helpful to take a step back and think, what do we actually want here? Uh, you know, do we, do we want a human centered world where AI and other technologies are helping us? So they're helping the environment, you know, they're helping society at large. I think focusing on our agency and the kind of world we want to see, we, we, we can't lose sight of that in these discussions. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. I, I do agree yeah, with, with uh, Marcus. I think it's all about what we want. Do we want it as a tool or are we fearful of it being a replacement 
of us. So I, I think I think as long as we are, you know, on top of it, right? Anyway, AI is created by the human. Its path and all that, right, is uncontrolled, just like any other uh, invention that we had. When once uncontrolled, then then it's destructive, and that that is our role, right, to control what we invent. So I think, um, well, as long as we're on top of it, I think we we shouldn't fear it. I think we should harness it and uh, look at it as our tool. And on the other point, I think um, I do agree with David, right, that uh, we, you know ethical AI may seem like an oxymoron, but but um, I tend to think of it like ethical AI is ensuring that AI does things right, whereas moral AI is ensuring that um, you know AI does the right thing, and and that that could be difficult, right? Uh, so it's only humans who are moral, uh, have moral you know um, uh, uh, features, but not not the machine. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Chung. That's a really wonderful statement. Uh, somehow, all the planes in Singapore decided to take off from NTU campus today, as <laughs> you noticed. Uh, so, uh, you just mentioned this kind of use of, of AI's tool, and there were two questions one by Raymond Chan and one by Antje Kalbo Norman, who is obviously Dutch, um, on the data behind it. So, what about rather than regulating the AI, uh, controlling the AI, what about? controlling or regulating somehow the data behind that or auditing the underlying data. Um, moving towards the more technical aspects on this, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a different approach to it. David. Uh, no, I, and actually, uh, so I think it's a great question and it circles back to why, and I, I especially when I was in the regulator role, uh, people would say like, oh, the answer of a regulator for everything is more regulation. But why actually I truly believe it's really important to have a data regulator is because there is a need for someone to look into this. There's need someone to put in place those requirements uh, from a hygiene point of view, from a governance perspective. And it goes beyond just data and personal privacy. It goes really down to the core and the structure of data and how it can be used effectively. And then finally is the acknowledgement and realization is that data transcends industry. The data that you're using for your, 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 your taxi ride can then suddenly be used for your healthcare provider. Can it can be used for financial modeling. It kind of um, exists in this kind of abstract universe. And the question is not, can we do it? Can we build these capabilities? Can we provide these services? Can we provide this stuff? Is should you be allowed to? And the should you be allowed to is, again, not to become philosophical. I will veer away from that. But it okay. is a moral, it is a societal question saying like, yeah, we can do that. I can build you a model to tell you exactly who you should not insure, but should we do that? So, so that's kind of the need to me, in my, from my perspective of starting. And in fact, just the last point to mention, the way I like to break down the world of AI is into the, these three pillars, data, including actually historical data and the importance of making sure that I like to just call it hygiene is a play, in place there modeling or AI modeling, the whole methodology, the practice, the techniques, the capacity, explainability, what it may be. And then finally, uh, what you was mentioning earlier is the actually the application of it is us using it. Just because a model says A doesn't mean we have to do A. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. As you are talking, I see many more questions coming in that are related to this. Uh, Malak is sending an impression, a uh, question, Francoise, sending in a question and it's really about the inherent bias that is already in the data. As you collect the data, of course, there's an inherent bias. Then as a machine learning node starts to learn on the data, it'll find patterns and will only use a little bit of the data to make those patterns. So it's a very reductionist view of, of the real world um, and, and the challenges that that brings. Peter Paul, we, we might need a philosophical view on that. What What is, bias in that case, how should we approach that? Yeah, it's indeed um, a, a very important thing because, uh, well, of course, bias means that you have some kind of a, a yeah, it's a prejudice about how to interpret the world. Uh, but if you look at real life, I think it's unavoidable that we have frameworks of interpretation. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe uh, what I say is, is not something that everyone shares, but I, I think in fact that biases are unavoidable and that we should uh, deal with them in a responsible way. So it doesn't mean we should just accept them. It's terrible if they work out in a bad way. Uh, it's maybe the same discussion uh, that you see, for instance, if it's about 
gender equity. I think uh, that there were waves in feminism uh, where uh, bias ultimately didn't mean that, uh, well, we should ignore differences between people, <laughs> yeah, but it should be about recognizing how, how we look the world, at the world, how we organize the world. And by recognizing differences, we can also see that there is a lack of equity. So um, in, in the same way, I think we should deal with data. Uh, and that's about how the data were um, uh, somehow collected. Uh, so that's where the biases is, maybe not in the algorithm themselves, but in, in the data themselves, but also the ways, of course, in which the algorithm deal with the data. It's typically what AI ethics tries to, uh, to do, uh, to say that, uh, well, we should avoid bias. The algorithm should be expert explainable, there should be transparency uh, of the of the data sets. So yeah, um, unavoidable, uh, important to deal with it in a responsible way. I, I just have to just say something very quickly on that one, okay. and, and potentially <laughs> controversial. In fact, I would even go one step further and say it's not only unavoidable, and I would say we should not avoid it. Um, a lot of times from a linguistic perspective, we take bias and discrimination negatively. Fundamentally, if we look at the world that doesn't have biasness or discrimination, means we don't physically do anything anymore. <laughs> we need it in, for a day-to-day -day element. Data science is by definition a methodology, a mathematical and statistical methodology for discrimination. You need bias because that is the underlying patterns and differences in behavior that you're trying to identify. Where it becomes very difficult, and I think the philosophical aspect of it, is when does bias and discrimination become negative? When it is representative of something that we do not want? And how do we carve those lines. And, and the reason I highlight this is because we need to be very, very careful. So for example, right now, and again, from a societal point of view, from a, from a cultural perspective, we can all agree, we are trying to eradicate certain types of discrimination and bias that we want to. But we need to be very careful that in 100 years from now, in 50 years from now, in 70 years from now, the exact things that we would try to eradicate didn't result in new biases that in 100 years from now, it's going to be their problem to solve effectively. So we, we kind of need to look at this in a very, very holistic level. Yep. Interesting. Yep. I mean, and this is this is something we really need another panel on because, <laughs> in a way, it's fighting words, David, and uh, it's something to to discuss in detail. There are actually quite a few questions coming in uh, that are really focused on each of you, and we're nearing the end of the panel, so I just wanted to pull out one or two of those. Um, um, Dr. Chong, you talk about. Um, AI as kind of like a tool, something that should be a tool. We should harness it to, for it to do to our benefit, kind of almost as like a neutral tool. Right? You mentioned it really matters what people do with it, what they do with AI is much more risk of people abusing the AI than the AI going nuts by itself, which is something I also uh, completely agree with. Uh, Devesh is asking uh, about, uh, about this particular statement, Peter Paul, whether, whether you feel uh, the same as, as Dr. Chung. Do you also feel that AI is a neutral, well, it's not that she's saying AI is a neutral tool, but that it is a tool that can be harnessed. What is, what is your position? Could AI be something like a neutral tool? How should we see it? Come yeah, no, I, your theories? Yes, so indeed, I think technologies are never neutral tools. <laughs> I think it's, it's more <clears throat> that when we use a technology, it connects us to the world somehow. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it can never be neutral. Uh, when we use it, it helps us to use it in a specific way. And uh, in that sense, uh, that, that helps me to see how values are linked to technologies. They're in their design, but they're also in their use, in their implementation, in an environment. Ethics is in that sense everywhere. And if you see them as something neutral, then of course it can help to, to show that there is human responsibility involved as well. Uh, but I think if you really see them as totally neutral, then you forget that there's also ethics in the, in the technologies. It's, it's everywhere, in the design, in the humans, in the social context. Yeah, so, so to answer to that, I think I, I, when I said neutral tool, I meant that um, it, it's, it is basically, I mean, it's mathematics, right? It's, it's what we make out of it, right? And what we develop. So, so as David mentioned, right, the three aspects of it, um, the data, right, the algorithms, which learns and, and it can, uh, you know, do much better than the, te the traditional technology of today because it learns, you know, all the time and it improves itself. But we just have to ensure that uh, it learns the right thing. It does the it, it learns the right things and in the right way, right? So, so to me, that that aspect of it makes it kind of neutral to the person because the person can use it for good or for bad, right? Um, if, if it can go bad, you know, without us knowing, right? Because if we like HR, right, uh, the way it selects uh, candidates. So if there's no um, 
that, that there's no inputs, right? And, and we don't actually uh, check it to see, oh, you know, it, it, it's gone on this bias path, but, but it doesn't know, you see, because AI is neutral because it's not life, right? So, so it makes a decision based on what we tell it to do. Right, and uh, it learns, you know, so it thinks it gets, it's getting better and better, you know, um, answering to our needs, right? But it doesn't know, you see. So, so that, that is what I meant that um, the humans have to intervene at some time, right? To, to see whether the outcomes are indeed ethical. So ethical is not moral, right? Ethical just means that it's doing the things that we asked it to do, yeah, you know. It's a very um, helpful framework. Thing. Yeah, yeah. I, that, I wanted to, to end with a last question for Marcus because we haven't heard from him for a bit. And, uh, Ellard is really interested, Marcus, in this idea of, you know, the uh, principles in different countries have similarity, but then the implementation of AI then becomes a very different exercise. Um, and there's interest uh, also with some other questioners about how could we deal with this, this kind of vagueness on the one hand, uh, you know, the implementation it becoming so different uh, in, in different countries. And while there also being similarities, how can we make this work in practice? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I think it, I think it comes back to this issue of context. I think there are going to be elements of commonality. We we have these global groups, like uh, I think Peter Paul was, it was mentioned before. You're involved in the global partnership on AI. It is important to have these global discussions where people can identify the commonality, but the context within an individual country, within an individual industry, even within those industries, you know, the way that an insurance company will be looking at fairness might be different to the way a bank might be looking at at, at fairness and that's just within the same industry of financial services. So I think that getting more and more to context, to specific use cases, to sharing those, that's been one of the things that's been so effective here in Singapore, I think, is the building up of use cases. So people can stop talking about this at the abstract and start saying, ah, I, I get it. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't think about it in that context. I didn't think that bias could be, emerge in that particular way. Uh, but now I know to ask the question when I'm developing my system in a different way. So it, it, the context matters. It's gonna be different from country to industry, um, you know, to, to, to societal context, um, but that's, that's appropriate. That's the way this is gonna, gonna have to unfold. Thanks, and I agree. These case studies, kind of transparency of how AI emerges will be really important for us to share with each other. And maybe that is a way of uh, collaboration between Singapore and the Netherlands to move forward to develop such a set of case studies of emerging AI and to really understand what are the conditions that need to be in place for responsible AI to be developed. Uh, I have to close the panel because it's already uh, three minutes to over so I really wanted to thank you wholeheartedly for this wonderful panel session, best yet, and uh, I will hand over to Tuan to do the goodbyes. Thank you so much, all. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for the very engaging and lively and lots of smiles and energy that we can see over the past hours. I have to say that among our recent webinars, we have seen the most percentage of uh, uh, the audience members actively participating through sending in questions and chat messages here. So, so bravo to everyone for making such a thought-provoking uh, session happening with us. And I want to build on what Marcus said, uh, that you know, it, 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 it is all about show, showing uh, and sharing about the use cases of how AI could actually be harnessed responsibly and SG Innovate, uh, uh, at SG Innovate, a big part of what we do is, is to enable such knowledge sharing session. And I think so after this one, uh, we will actually get on uh, uh, preparing for the next uh, session on AI ethics, where we select use cases from the industry uh, uh, so that you know, more and more people can actually see how things can be implemented. And with that, I, I, I look forward to, to keeping in touch with everyone, uh, our speakers and our members of the audience alike on this conversation. And uh, do uh, uh, let us know if there's anything else we can work with you or your organizations to advance the conversation on AI ethics. All right. And thank you very much once again to everyone. Uh, uh, have a good day ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.